Um, so when we were making a decision about what framework to pick, you know, early on during development, um, at that time Angular was still in beta, so we were not going to go with that. Um, we were used to using Knockout, so that was kind of a go-to framework. But again, interest in the framework in general was uh, kind of fading away, and uh, we felt that maybe there wasn't enough development. Like for over seven, eight months, there wasn't a single commit on the repo. Uh, we looked at React; we really liked it. But what we liked most about React was um, I suppose a fundamental idea that you can just re-render the entire screen, the entire app, the entire DOM. And we really like JavaScript. I mean, we are only a web app, we do SaaS. So we, we're not right now building mobile apps. So we're not getting to React Native or Ionic or any of those things. So what we said was, okay, fine, let's do a trial run, right? Let's try to build something which kind of uses the same idea that, hey, you can re-render the whole screen. And let's see where it goes from there. And at that time, we really thought this would never work. Like anything we build at home is pretty much going to be pretty bad. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, you... uh, okay. oh it's, it's squeaking, right? No, no. no, no. I'll it's try not to squeak. Yeah. Really. I'll try not to squeak. <laughs> um, <laughs> apologies. So yeah, we thought anything we bad will be anything we build will be really bad, and so that so we thought of calling it underdog first because you know the underdog JavaScript framework. But because it's based on underscore and jQuery. And is inspired by Knockout. We thought maybe under Knock is a better name, and we finally settled on under Kick. So that's where the name comes from. One of the things about this framework uh, right now, it already does support um, UMD loading. So if you're using Require.js, you can use it with that. If you're using Browserify, it should work with that as well. But at least for this demo, I'm just going to use plain old JavaScript includes. I can include a couple of script files and see where it goes from there. Because at least for demos, I don't like to expect other people to do tooling and stuff. If you want to get quick start guide, uh, you should be able to start quickly. So this is the app you're going to build right on the screen right there. It's a dynamic app. The reason I built this is it was not actually sync to a server. It does have no front end framework. So this is supposed to local storage. And if you have a single user or freelancer, it's reasonable to assume that you're the only person who's using the app, so you don't need a server sync. We also have a same tab over here, which allows you to export your data on other devices, back it up to drop and things like that. So let me just show you how it works before we get into building it. Whether you type the name of the project you're working on, um, task you're working on, what your hourly rate is, if you're charging on a per hour basis, this would be whatever currency you want. I'm just going to do 3,000 for now. And then you just say start tracking. Then we expect you to navigate away from the tab, do whatever work you were doing, and once you're done, you come back and you say start tracking. Tax how much time you spent, how much money you're supposed to get paid, and that's like the basics. Obviously, you can edit these entries. So if you want to say you spent 30 minutes and not just I guess in seconds, you can just save those changes and it'll you know automatically change your rates and everything like that. You can delete entries. Now, just to show you a couple of other features, let me just quickly add a couple of other tasks. And I'll increase the time span as well. So maybe hundreds on this. And let's just have a project as well. You can name these anything. It's completely up to you. You want to stop tracking again and change that. Maybe just what you that. Okay. So now you've basically been working for a month or so, and now it's time for you to build your customers. So you're going to do your filters. And you say, okay, fine, I want from this day to this day. So just show me everything in project two. And then only show you project two, uh, showing only from project one, only project one. It tells you what the total amount is. You can edit and delete from here itself. So you click edit, it shows up back over there. Same thing you want to export this data to your Dropbox or something to keep it safe. If you use, if you're like me and you disable all your tools and no so storage, you can delete. It's a bit louder on your desktop. Okay, got it. So if you disable the feature and keep clearing your page like me, you might want to back this up on the text file. And then there's just some about license. It's open source, the API, uh, AGPI. That's what we're going to build. Any questions about this? About what it is that we're going to build? Now, I know most of these apps and frameworks basically do a simple to-do list. I did not want to do that because everyone's bored of it, so I chose a time tracker. But the concept is to show, to show you enough features of the applications that you can actually build real apps. And I also tried to build a demo which somebody could actually in real world use. So that's why in the beginning I asked the freelancer out here, because if you charge an hourly basis, you can actually right now go home and start using it. There's no need to you know, 
do anything when it's all eating. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, what I've done for the purpose of this demo is I've created a bunch of files. So if this would be my lab. The CSS is, I think, less than 40 lines. It's barely anything. Amber.js holds all the JavaScript, and ninja.html is the final version. I also got version 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So we progressively add more and more features to the application. I don't have multiple JavaScript files because uh, the app is written progressively. So as we scroll down and as we move towards further lines, we will implement more and more features and they'll be reflected in the HTML. Okay? So right now, here we are. I'm just going to check the CSS one time to show you how little it is. It's barely anything, I'm not in CSS. The framework I'm using for this application, the CSS framework, is called Pure CSS. It's from Yahoo. The reason I use that is it's uh, a very small and constrained. It doesn't have any drop downs or something. So it doesn't give me fancy ideas to implement those things. To keep things simple, I'm using Pure. That's AdWords.js. Uh, you see these XXX lines, they're not to do's. They're markers for me to move from one version to the next version. So I know it's say from V2 to V3, that's when I open up time in job number three. Okay, let's start from BZ. This is the basic app. It's just doc type HTML, a header with a title in it, and a body. If you use the app, you should be very familiar with the render target. This is where the app is going to be rendered. And this is something that's different from the app. It's the source template, the template that they're going to be rendering into the render target. We also have components and stuff. We'll get into that in, you know, as we progress. So that's it. Over here, we just have dependency. jQuery, underscore, and another itself. That's it. Everyone's on the same page over here. Pretty simple stuff. So in the beginning, it might feel like I'm going a little slow because I want to make sure that everyone is comfortable. But once we get there, towards the end, it's going to go pretty fast as well. So just give me a few, you know, a couple of versions until we are on there. Also, I wanted to make sure that even if somebody was a newcomer to JavaScript or somebody just getting started with JavaScript development, this would make sense to them. All right. So let's move on to version one now. So what version one does was is it populates the script template. It just puts in a header and it says, hello, I am TN Rapid. TN is basically the application name space for Time Ninja. And now it makes sense for me to show you app.js. So right now TN is just a single variable. It just says that app name is Time Ninja. And UK is an instance of Undertale. Now if you use React, you can only have one React on the entire page. That's not true with Undertale. You can have multiple Undertale. Because we realized there was a lot of legacy code which we had to deal with, and we were not at once willing to change all components to undertake. So you can have multiple components on the same page, and as you become more comfortable with it, you can merge them together. This is one I want to always comment it out. It's also repeated at the very end of this file. So I'll just show it to you if you want. That's the same line over there. What this line does is it says, very simply, take this uh, variable tn, which we referred to as the app model, you can think of this as states and props combined or something like that from a React perspective. Uh, get the template from the ID source template over here. That's the ID of this element over here. And once you've done that, render it into the render target. And inside the render target, please call this variable tn. If I don't do this default name is model. Right? Because I won't refer to this tn, I just say call it tn. That's it. So once this is up and running, I should be able to open this in my browser. Let me just do that. That's it. You say hello world, I am time vendor. This template over here has been done. Great. Can I move ahead to the next one? Great. Time vendor two. Let me see the directions which I have for myself. In version one, version two, you're setting up the tabs and bits and stuff like that. So we have multiple tabs. You know, for tracking, for filters, for syncing, and stuff like that. So I'm just going to go ahead and set up a bunch of tabs over here. This is just how Pure sets up tabs in their own syntax or in their own CSS classes. And a bunch of to-do statements. Nothing fancy going on over here either. So let me go back into the browser and just say number two. Okay. So now what we're going to do is actually start using it. Until now we were just setting up our application. Now we start using it. These to do's will one by one start to disappear. And this is the actual application and you know time tracking and filtering software going in there. All right. So the first thing I wanted to ask you is has anyone over here ever used knockout JS? Okay, is anyone using RxJS? Yes. 
Okay, so uh, are you so you familiar with the idea of uh, observables? Okay, so for anyone else, let me just tell you what an observable is. Uh, you could ask simply as I can, an observable is a property in your model such that when it changes, that change is reflected in the UI. This changes, that changes. Another thing which you can do is um, observables can have subscribers. So you can subscribe for an observable change. And there are also other things which you can do, which you'll get to because you're actually going to be doing that. So let's start. In a router. Now the reason I've used this kind of syntax of like defining an anonymous function and calling it immediately is if you are using AMD, they require JS or something else, and you are using multiple modules, this could be a module right here. But for the demo, I wanted to put everything in one file, so I've not done that. So over here, Again, to keep the line width short, because I know I'm going to be protecting the screen, I have used small available things, otherwise you can just call it louder instead of R. So it has a default route ID, that's called tracker. So if you just go back to two, that was the ID for the tracker element, also repeated over here. And it has this O thing. Now O is just a convention which I use for observables. Because observables follow a different syntax for getting and setting data, as opposed to normal variables. So I say R at or active ID is a UK observable. So UK is my analytic instance. Observable is defining observable. And what I pass in those per app in, in those params is the default value. So it starts out completely there. So I'm defining R at or active ID as an observable, which is currently the MP strike. Then R dot on hash change. So this is very simple routing. So if I just go back to the full test application, the final version that is. You can see that. Routing is completely okay. I'll just show it to you. Right, routing is simply hash based. There is no query parameter or anything fancy going on. At least for this demo, we have other routers which go with other cases that have all of those things. But right now, we just want to build our own router, particularly to demonstrate both of this. So what happens is when the when the hash changes, we get the active ID. This is just a variable active ID, which is location of hash or the default ID. So if you open up a router that we don't know, we just open the default route instead. Otherwise, you open the cloud, you're trying to open. And then we set active ID to that thing. Done. Remember, we're not changing the UI at all, at least not yet. And then, of course, this hash change handle actually needs a subscription to win it or not hash change. That's it. But because I'm using jQuery, I use a slightly formal version. Otherwise, you could have said something like win or on hash change equals R or on hash change. That would also work. The next thing I'm doing is immediately when the application loads, I'm triggering R on hash change. The reason is, for example, over here, let's say I'm on the filter tab and I hit refresh. I stay in the filter tab. That's because on page load, I'm checking this hash. So even though there hasn't been a hash change, I'm asking my application to act as if there has been one so as to get the initial hash value, the initial fragment value. Is that okay? So all this does is make sure that if you refresh the page, you don't go back to the track or you stay in the app if you go in. And that's just return on return on getting assigned to the end of router. Now, things are interesting because now this has to be implemented on the front end. All we are doing is adding this class to it. You cannot if it's like a shorthand delivery operator. We don't like the delivery operator syntax. So we avoid it if we can. Um, so if, this just says that if the uh, router dot active ID, notice the call to active ID, because active ID is an observable, to get its value, I just call it. To set its value, I call it with a parameter, the value becomes the parameter value. If that is tracker, if that is not tracker, excuse me, then this is hidden. So as long as the active ID is not tracker, this first route or this first tab is going to be hidden. And the same applies to all the tabs. That's it. So this is volume three. Let me demo it to you, and then I'll ask, if, take any questions if you have them. We're going to dash three. Okay, so you see, we've got tabbing, filtering, scientific filtering, implementation <laughs> about. So let me just go back to the. Any questions over here in the HTML? Okay, any questions in app? Okay, any questions in here? This is meant to be simple stuff so that you understand how this active ID changes. Let me open up my console real quick. And let me say tn dot router dot o dot active id is tracker. Is it, is it already tracker? No, it's not. I'm just going to set it to tracker. You see, it opened up the tracker. However, please note that the hash is not changed. Right? The hash is remain the same because the hash is not aware of um, 
what are you doing? It's still about. When I refresh, you open the bar because that's what it thinks the hash is. Okay. Can I move on? Yeah. Okay. So let's go back and add JS. Yes. Let me just make a these initial versions. Now that we've, that we've taken care of routing, let's just write some miscellaneous functions which you will need. A simple get unique ID function with generation ID, which we believe will be unique enough as far as a single user is concerned. Nothing fancy going on over there. A format time delta function. What this takes is what this does is it takes an input some many seconds out and outputs these many hours, these many minutes, these many seconds. That's it. Simply for formatting, it doesn't really do anything. A function for formatting the timestamp. Just to show you a calendar date as opposed to a UPC millisecond timestamp, which nobody can actually read. That's it. Right? Nothing fancy going on at all. Now we introduce some of the ideas involved in actually tracking time. So you already seen the app. You need a button that says start tracking, and then you need a button that says stop tracking. And then you need a button that says, okay, fine, edge this record. And you need another button that says, add me a new record, which is you know, outside this outside the system. You cannot you, you not track this data for me, but I want you to record it anyway. So right now we just want to do the start tracking, stop tracking thing in other game. Keeping it plain and simple. So there are a bunch of observables over here. Uh, on my screen, all these comments from a single line, but I did anticipate that this would happen. Anyway, so start time is the time at which the timer was started. Or it's going to be an observable which holds the time at which the timer was started. Now is an observable which holds the current timestamp, which is updated every, milli every second. Not every millisecond, every second, because that much precision is enough for us. Project is the name of the project you're working on, as you saw in the demo. The first screen was project, that's this over here, the current project you're working on. Task is the current task. How we charge is the current how we charge, and that's it. These three observables we'll talk about a little later. But let me just talk about them a little bit now. These under edit ask simple question: what is the ID of the activity? And activity being the what I used to describe the thing that I'm doing. What's the ID of the activity that is currently being edited? If there is no activity being edited, this will be falsely or not. Okay. Minute count and start date, start date count are just helpers, and I'll get to them in a second. Is it fine? Which is defined observables. Observables basically tell us what are the things in the application that we care about and that we want to track. So we want to track these things essentially for the tracker. Then we have a simple set interval every one second. T dot four dot now gets updated to underscore dot now. Underscore dot now is the same as date dot now or new date dot get time. If you're not using you see using underscore. So every second, this observable is going to have a new value, and any change in it will automatically be visible to me in my UI. Great. Now we introduce a new concept. Let's instead of talking about TLC dot more, let's talk about TLC dot flat time. Just like you do T dot O or use the O prefix for observable, I choose to use a C prefix for computers. A computer is something which computes a value and returns it to you based on observable values. So say you have an observable for first name and last name, you could have a computer for first for full name, which essentially is first name plus last name. So we're looking at computer for track time. How much time have we actually tracked? If start time is falsy, we just return zero. Because it means we're not tracking anything. That's why the start time is falsy. Otherwise, we just return the time right now minus the start time. That's how much time we track. So in case you were wondering why this math dot max zero is here, is because t dot now minus t dot start time can become negative because of the one second precision. So for a very small second, for a small duration less than one second, it can be negative. To prevent that from ever happening, just set that to zero. It's really a minor detail. This is all that really counts. And flat charge is, well, we know how much time you spend, and we know how the rate is. So we can tell you how much you're supposed to get paid for that time. And this is just a calculation for that. It takes three seconds, converts that to a number of hours, applies the hourly rate, or just sets it to zero. That. What you see in this uh, array over here is a dependency that the computer depends on. So whenever start time changes, or now changes, flat time will automatically be recomputed. That's exactly what a computer does. Internally, of course, we subscribing to start time and now and doing the calculation for you again. Flat charge, in turn, subscribes to flat time, so you can also subscribe to computers, not just observables, and the hourly rate. Okay. Is this much fine? There's no HTML that we're talking about. We're just talking about what are the variables we need to track, and what are the computer variables that we can come up with. One thing I forgot to mention over here was C.C.Mode. Now the entire app can 
the way in which we designed it, the way in which you saw the demo can be three modes. Either you're tracking time, or you're editing by activity, or you're doing nothing. You're just sitting there. When you're tracking time, you're only tracking time, you can't edit activities. When you're editing activities, you can only do that, you can't do anything else. And when you're sitting there, you can do either of the other two. So if start time is QT, then you're in tracking mode. Otherwise, if there's some ID just being edited, then you're in editing mode. And otherwise, you're in still mode. That's all it says. Okay. Now let's move on to with the repo. So this is where I actually will introduce quite a bit of code at one time. But the only reason I'm doing this is I have to. All of this code will be in the link. So let's just move on to repo there. Okay. So in the previous version, um, tracker was just a to-do statement. Now we're going to write that to-do. And then actually going to actually do the thing which we are required to do. So where am I? Okay. So here's the tracker. This is the code for the tracker. So we can ignore the things after later on. There we go. So we'll try to fit it just on the screen, right? The header is not really very helpful or useful. Now, as long as you're in still mode, and you can ignore editing for now, as long as you're in still mode, we need to show the tracking form. The one which asks the project task, how do we can start tracking? So this is that form right here. This pure U one fourth is just um, pure CSS build system. We can ignore that. Basically, there are four inputs. Uh, excuse me, three inputs, one, two, three, and finally a submit part. It asks for the project, it asks for the task, the hourly rate, and the submit button. Now the value over here is pre-populated by the observable value. So when I was looking at or doing the demo, you saw that when I said stop tracking, the task field was not empty. I can show it to you again. Okay, so let me get rid of that. Let me just say project two. And let's say task one, two, three. Now we did 3,000 again. Stop tracking. Now, when I say stop tracking, these are mainly populated when this is gone. That's because it's designed that way. Uh, what we do is we manually set this to empty because we expect you to be working on different tasks for the same project at the same day. That's just the guess we are making about your habits, about most freelancers. Okay. So, try to understand this, this is very different from maybe some of the other libraries. This is simply a binding from the model data to the UI. There is no backward binding from UI to model. This is just a one-way binding, model to UI. You can call it forward, you can call it backward based on your preferences, it's model to UI. Okay. And the same applies for the rest of these as well. Okay. Now if you're in editing mode, we're going to be adding some more options over here. Like what was the how many minutes did you find and what was the start time? So let me demo that again. So if I edit this entry, it asks to do more fields. So that'll come out later. I'm going to just say that as is. Okay. Now, if you're not in, edit, in still mode, and you're not in editing mode, that means you're in tracking mode. That's why this else comes in over here. And it simply says that tracking is on. It shows you a big old button to stop that tracking. And it shows you how much time has passed. So use that format time data function, which takes milliseconds and gives you hours, minutes, and seconds, and puts in the track time over here, if you're on a computer for computing. Is this much fine? Now, remember that we still need to react to events when they occur. Now, there are two events of interest here, just two actually. The first is this form being submitted. When you hit the start tracking button, you're actually submitting the tracking form. So, this is the basically binding syntax that we've come up with for binding events, and we reformat that for you. So, it says data on submit, call tracker.onSubmit tracking. And <coughs> surely enough, we'll have refined that right here. I'm just showing you how we things over here on this event, which is a simple event, call this function. Functions, remember, this is not the end of tracker. This is just a path to the tracker. A path, the way in which you would maybe use on Firebase, a path to a JSON document. This path could be anything. You could use pipes to specify that path. Those two paths are identical. Basically, it says take your model, refine, do model dot tracker, and then get model dot tracker or on submit tracker. It does successful refinements. That's all it is. I just want to go back to the bottom location because most folks are you know, most comfortable with that. Is this fine? And this is just syntax out here. And over here, when you're done submitting, there's something similar going on. Let me. Okay. Uh, when this button gets clicked, if it's visible and it gets clicked, then you call this function. On click, stop tracking. That's it. Let's go into JavaScript and see what happens over there. 
So we have a tracking complex somewhere. We look at the mode in which it was somewhere. Right now we're not looking at anything more, so we just install mode. And when that happens, we just call it or start tracking this submission event. By the way, event handlers also get the default submission event parameter, which would get in jQuery or common handlers. And you can also get additional information, which we will show you. And you know, as we progress, we will use more and more features and show you how that's done as well. Okay, so we are over here. So what we do is we set the observable value to the value you enter. The same thing with the task. The same thing with the hourly rate, with the exception that we pass that as a number. And the start time is the current time. We don't do anything. All we're doing is we're updating our observables. By setting our start time, remember that we are now that the track variable mode will shift from going into still state to tracking state. Right? But we don't have to do that explicitly, it'll happen on its own because it knows what it needs to do. When you click start tracking, we create an activity, and this is what an activity object property looks like. It has not all the properties, but most of them. It's an ID. We get a unique ID, one that we believe is fairly unique at least for one time. The project again comes up with observable, the task comes up with observable, the start time with observable, and the hourly charge also from the observable. I just noticed actually I've been voting this twice. I just needed to do it once. The number passing thing. Anyway, next we set task start time to null. Because the minute I set start time to null, it means I'm not in tracking mode anymore. The UI will switch back to still mode automatically. Or rather, because of our computer relationships. Now, the amount of time I've spent with something I'll calculate, that's now minus the start time. And I'll calculate how much money I've earned. And ultimately, I will uh, insert it at the beginning of the list. So, new records show up at the top, not at the bottom. That's just a simplicity because anytime you enter, you want to scroll all the way to the bottom to see the new record. Um, so, if you are used to using push, that adds to the end. Unship is just the same thing, but adds to the head as opposed to the tail. And then we clear the task. Because we don't want the task to remain there, we want you to enter a new task as we expect that the case, you know, that's of course going to happen. Is this fine? So what I'm now going to do is I'm actually going to let me just make sure that none of the changes are breaking. Let me go back to the original version. And I'm going to show you our version four of the app. And already the core of the application is going to have new built. We enter a project. Project A. Task A1, I will give it maybe this time a little less, maybe, and I say start tracking. This part of the UI which says tracking is on and gives me a stop tracking button is already implemented. So when I say stop tracking, number of activities are supposed to increase by one because you will add a new activity. And you see that happens. Now, the part that I did not show you was these two lines, I kept it on because they were not putting on the screen, was this part over here. Did you implement time change because we haven't implemented that yet? But the only thing we are talking about is the length of the activity list. That's the number of activities that you already have. So we're just showing that, and okay, fine, we know we have implemented time sheet. Instead of showing you a table view of it, let me just show you how many there are for now, and later we'll implement the table view as well. Is everything fine with this? If you have any questions, please ask, right? No issues. Okay. No so, uh, I was wondering yeah. that when you would probably use a computed property or something like that, you get it, like the dot today. Mm -hmm. Would that be a computed property as well? You could have a computer to track that. Yeah. So, so whenever an observable changes the computer, the computer property is recalculated. Right? Correct. But the, the reason I did not do that in this case <laughs> is because um, it would just be a one-line computer. And anyway, this was like a you know temporary. Excuse me. This was like a temporary thing. I want to replace all of that code with actual tables. But please bear in mind when the observable changes, while all link computers will change, the observable itself will also change. Right? So I don't need a computer every night. The observable itself is going to be changing. Okay. Great. So we took care of uh, that. Let's move on. Now we need to improve tracking and the stop tracking button. This is just um, to make things look a little bit better. So let me just show you what that means. So if I have a project, maybe this time, again, project A, task A2, I will need it maybe. The usual this line. Um, this data over here needs to kind of be a little better. That was B5 to B6, right? And I showed you a B5 at one time. That's B6. So instead of showing you the old volume, um, let me give you a little bit of information about what you're actually working on. 
because you might have been away from the screen for a long time. So we just add some tacky details. Nothing fancy. Um, the time and the charge as well is all calculated and displayed there. So let's see how that's going to work. Let's V6. What was V4 or V5? Oh yeah, we completely forgot this step. Uh, set up a table for viewing the time sheet. Let's do that first. My apologies, right? I completely forgot about that. I missed that line. So let me open up V5. So basically, that thing over there where we had one line that said um, number of to do's, we replace that with the table. Right over here. So the columns of the table are pretty standard. They're just the ones you see on the screen. Again, on my screen, this fits on one line. Over here, it doesn't. Anyway, that doesn't really matter. Now, the project is activity dot project. No, wait, let me just show you the each loop. This is basically the syntax for looping. If you use underscore before or ERP site templates, this is pretty much it. Also, notice anything you write within these is actual JavaScript. So you can write anything. You can write an if, you can write uh, variable declarations, you can write each loop, you can also write for variable in this, whatever syntax you use, you can use that. Uh, this is the beginning of the function. This is the beginning of the body of the function. Uh, sorry, the body of the IJT function, the one you find over here. And then this closes the IJT function. You can see that the brackets match up and so on and so forth. You would need all of that, uh, as opposed to maybe something like Moostat, where you say, shall eat something, or I don't remember the syntax exactly, but something like that. Or you, know, you just use actual JavaScript, whatever you want to do. Um, activity index and activity is just something that each loop automatically supplies. Nothing that I'm doing over there. So we just show the project, the task. Uh, we format the timestamp of the start time. We show you how much time you spent by formatting the time data. Uh, we charge fixed in decimal places. And a little to do over here, we want to add edit and delete button. We're going to do that a little later in a higher version. But for now, we're just introducing this. So basically, just looping and rendering. That's it. OK, fine. I'm not going to spend more time on that now. Is that fine? OK, great. So now it comes to volume 6. Let's see, let's see what we're supposed to do there. Uh, in volume 6, you're supposed to improve tracking and the stop tracking button, like we previously discussed, a little too early by mistake. So over here, uh, yeah. So basically, we're just showing on the table over there. Again, please forgive my formatting. Uh, the screen resolution is changed when you plug in an adapter. This is really supposed to fit on one line. Uh, at least it did on my screen. Uh, let me just try to reformat that though, at least a little bit. OK, just forget it. Basically, it says the project is this, the task is this, the time is this, format time data, the track time, and the charge is the track charge. Nothing fancy. Let's move ahead. Um, allowing users to edit, delete, and manually enter activities. The fun part, kind of, I guess. So here, what we do is we implement just this TV, as far as HTML is concerned. There was a big to do over here, said edit, delete, and manual entry. So the edit and delete coming over here, the manual entry is somewhere else. I'll show it to you in a second. So all this says is, um, first of all, this is a variable declaration right in the stretch. Let me just redo that thing. OK, it's not putting a one line over here. Forgive me for that. Well, let me read it out to you and tell you what it does. The disabled attribute is basically if the mode is not still, then it's disabled. So you can only edit or delete when you're in still mode. If you're tracking something else, you cannot delete a different record. Or if you're already editing a record, you cannot edit a different record. That's what this does. So if you're in still mode, it's enabled. In all other cases, it's going to be disabled. So over here, we just take that value, which could either be disabled or empty string, and plug it over here. So if it's disabled, it'll say button class empty, disabled data on there. On every click, call this function. On click, edit, edit activity. So this is a new part of it. Uh, data art. Let me put this on the same line. Please try it. Yeah. Data art. Data art says, just like for data call, you supply a path to the data in your model, you can also supply an argument to the function that you're going to call instead of having to infer that. And the way we should do that is you supply another path, but this time a path to the object or the parameter for that function. So tracker or board activity list on activity index. Now remember, you don't need to resolve observables by calling the double brackets. This is undertaking and undertaking know that observables need to be well unwrapped, so to speak. So and you can also have dots. Now if dots may be comfortable, you can use a pipe character. And that also would work just fine. In fact, you can keep it that way just to show you some things. <coughs> okay? I want to say this. So what that says is when is this click, call this function, but also pass it as a first argument. Now, this argument is simply the same as this activity object over here. It's just a reference to it on the model. 
you can't just pass an activity over here because uh, under the, uh, the rendering framework doesn't know what activity is because it's based on object, it doesn't know what to render here. You just need to give a pass to it. Any questions about this? Do you want me to explain it once again? Okay, great, amazing. So what I'm going to do in this case is, uh, that's it. This is the edit button over here, the delete button over here. Let's look at the JavaScript of what happens when you click that button. So when you click edit activity, the first parameter over here is the activity. Because that was the R we passed in. The event, which is usually passed for event handler, is also here. But I have preceded by two underscores to remind myself that I'm not going to use it. In fact, I'm not going to use it at all. It's just for demo purpose, I want to tell you that there's an event over there as well. Okay. So the first thing we do is, since we know this act, we have this activity in hand and we know this ID, we immediately set t dot ID under edit. When we do that, our mode automatically becomes edit, editing mode, right? Because ID under edit is not true. Thing. We set the project to the activities project. The task, the activities task, the hourly rate to the activities hourly rate. This is just populating the <coughs> inputs. Uh, minute count. Now, when I ask you how much time you spend, I don't expect my users to tell me how many milliseconds they spent. That would be absurd. They would tell me how many minutes they spent. So, so what we do is how much of time they spend convert it to minutes and we populate that to minute count. The minute count is just a helper for that. And start day stop is the date at which or the timestamp at which you start and things. And that just computes that from a millisecond timestamp to something that's human readable and puts that into this variable over here. Now you can ignore this for just a second. We'll get into that in a linear version. And you can also ignore the depo part because that is linked to the if segment. Then what we do is we simply Close the header of the element interview. Now, right now, when you're doing the demo, there were just a couple of tasks. But you can imagine there being hundreds of even more tasks. And if you edit a task at the, at the end, you want to be able to scroll all the way up because that's where the editing form is. So we just scroll the header back interview. That's it. Now, let me just quickly run this version of the app. Um, it won't show you the whole story because we've not actually completely gone through this version yet. Let me stop right there. Okay, so we see this button that's not show, showing up. And if I click edit, it does that. Now, just for the sake of you know, demo, let me just write some random values in here. I'm trying to you know, overflow my screen height. Okay, there we go. If I say edit, it just goes back up. That's what the scroll back into view was doing. Now, we could have also made it so that if you edit over here, the entire row becomes editable. But there was a reason I did not do that, which I'll get to a little later. Because I wanted to progressively show you what Anakit can do and not all at once. But that also is possible, definitely possible with Anakit. Um, great. Now, what happens is when you, again, submit, now let's look at the form, the form of the changes, the tracking form itself is basically overloaded. It, it serves two purposes. You can use it to track new events or to update existing ones. So this was the mostly last thought. If the mode is still just show a start tracking button. Otherwise so and yeah. A little slow. A little slow. A little slow. Sure. I mean don't go that fast. We can understand. Okay. Got it, got it. I'll go I'll go a little I'll go a little slowly. I'll go a little bit slowly. Okay. So in the beginning when we were entering this form, we said uh, render this form only when you're either in still mode or editing mode. In earlier versions, the editing mode did not make sense because ID under edit would always be false, but now it's going to be choosy as well. So within this first case statement where we render the form inputs, there's a possibility you're in editing mode. So if you're not in still mode, you're in editing mode. And in that case, we add three more inputs. The first input is just a hidden value, which just points to the ID that is currently being edited. Just fix that up on the observables and plugs it in there. Uh, next, we add the minute count. Again, just plug it in the observables, take it from the observables, plug it in. And we also add the start date. Take it on the observable, put it in. Now again, like before, these are just model three Y bindings. We'll get into two-way bindings in higher sections where we will report and stuff. Is this fine? Now remember, the submit button, the original submit button, which said um, start tracking is no longer visible. Instead, there's a button over here that says save changes. So let me show that to you. If I say, this is a window, let me just refresh. If I say edit, this is that button, save changes over here. So we basically show this button, this is a back button, 
and format these as large inputs just for the sake of making things look, I guess, proper. Or anyway, this is fine. Now, so now we make changes to our form. That our form can not only serve to track new activities but also update activities, and we set up buttons to indicate to our application that the user intends to do that. All we now have to do is when he actually submits the form and edit mode, he will actually update the activity because that's the intention of this one, right? So now if I go back a little bit, and when you submit the tracking form over here, we were checking which mode you were in. If you were in still mode, we did this, start tracking. If you're in editing mode, we did update activity. So I'm just going to go down and show you that, how that works. We are updating this activity over here. Um, all we do is we get the activity. Now, again, I'm just going to find where just a feature that helps me find this, uh, this activity by ID. You could look over all the elements and find the one you're looking for if that's what you want. The minute count is passed. The start time is also passed. Uh, if it's if the start time is of non-date value, then we tell the user that to enter something that's you know a little better for us. Then we calculate how much time we spent from the minute count. Ultimately, what our new charge is going to be, what the total charge is going to be, and then we just update the activity using underscore This one is a little interesting because it brings my attention to the point. Right now, every activity object is not an observable. Like activity or project is not an observable. We could have made it an observable. And if it were not observable, when we update it, the UI would get updated. But it's not an observable. And the reason it's not an observable is because I wanted to keep things simple, at least in the beginning. Later on, we get into double bindings and stuff like that. Because of that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reset the activity list to itself. I know that's okay, but what's the point of setting a variable to itself? The reason is this is a variable reference. And when you tell me that the object is set to itself, I don't know if the object has changed or not. Because the internal property might have changed. And the reference of the object remains the same. So as far as Anarchy is concerned, this is as good as the object underlying uh, the underlying code changing, which actually it has. You, know, you see there's a new activity or right? the activity has changed. So what this does is it tells all our bindings to refresh things. Uh, we stop being under edit mode and we clear the task. That's it. Now the task we were editing has fully been edited. We are going to go. The only thing that we did, which was a little cheeky, which maybe we would have done differently, is have different forms for tracking and editing. That could have made it code simpler. But I don't know for what reason I was into me doing when I was building this code, I said let's do the same form and let's just overload what we do with it. I guess primarily that happened because three of the fields, three out of five fields were the same. More than half the form was the same. So I said, let's just use that again. Any questions over here? Okay, great. Uh, the rest of the part is really simple. If you if you get edit right, getting read right is very simple. Um, like that. Oh, yeah. So edit was edit. The thing is very similar to edit. It's pretty much the same. Just call the different function and the name of the button is the read. That function is basically a one line over here which says activity list or without activity. Now, if you use underscore, you know there's a function called underscore or without, which takes an element and removes that element from the list. Because we like underscore, we added that built in functionality to observe the array as well. But otherwise, you could have taken the array, uh, removed the activity you want, and you set it back. That would have also worked if you wanted to like do the long form method. Because removing things from a list is so the comment that is just already there and okay. <clears throat> so and also like push and unshift and splice and all those functions which you usually call an array, at least most of them they will actually be called called observed arrays. Okay. The only thing that's left now, which is a little interesting, is a manual entry. Because um, I'll be very honest with you, this was the last this was kind of the last feature I implemented. Because I felt if I don't implement this, the project is not complete. Or that the demo is not complete. So here's Here's the manual entry. Let me just search for it. Wait, yeah, manual entry. Entry. There we go. Okay, there we go. Add manual entry. What we do over here is it's just a button. And when you click, you just call this function on click manual entry. Nothing fancy happening in the UI. Now, this, this button is uh, going to the right just about time change. So that it looks kind of good and stuff like that. In AppJS, this is what we do. We basically start tracking. 
This is complete pretend. We're not actually tracking anything. But we pretend as if we are starting to track something. And what I'm passing over here is basically a fake event out there. Every event has event or target. So we did something like event or target or project or value. That will give you the value of the project input. Over here, I'm taking a value between the empty string, essentially. So this is simulating an event start tracking click with project lag and the task lag, and now we charge zero and stuff like that. Once I started tracking, I need to be stop tracking because I'm not really interested in tracking anyway. But when you start and stop tracking, what you it has only done is you create a new activity object which gets unshifted or pushed the head of the activity list. I just get a reference to it. In that our activity list zero. That's the activity I just created. And then I put that activity in editor. I'm just going to give you a second to think about that. If you have questions, ask me. I know this is cheeky. I told you this is the last thing I did. There are probably a better ways of doing this. Better in the sense that there are going to be developers after you who are going to be reading your code, and this is my for that. At least, if you were to do something, at least explain it to them like, as, as to what your intentions are. But let me just tell you again we start tracking, we immediately stop tracking. The effect of that is a new activity gets created. There will be varying time on the activity, so that might be like a zero second activity, but we really don't care because we want to edit that anyway. And then we put that activity in edit mode. So basically, simulate a click on the edit button of that activity. This is all simulation. And the effect of that is you feel like you can add uh, new stuff. So let me say add panel entry. You see that immediately happened right there. So as far as the UI is concerned, you actually did four or five actions, but in reality, you did nothing. So project M. Task M1, 3,000, 100, sure. And I could maybe change this for So we see that new entry showing up right over here. Now, what you notice is entries are always being added to the top. So, how can we filter these entries? That's what filter is there for. We're going to get to that in a second. All right, let's go back to app. Now, what is the second portion A? Data syncing with local storage and import export. That's the next thing we're going to tackle. Let me open up. Okay. Again, this is this stuff is much simpler than setting the tracker because the tracker really forms the core of your business logic, so to speak. You are a time tracking app, and once you implement a time tracking, the rest of the stuff is well, secondary or ancillary or however you call it, and also easy to do by the way, not hard. Uh, so this is the div or the tab that takes care of data tracking. Right here. <laughs> and here's what we do: we just write out some instructions, we just save. Just copy the data from the next header below, the load, copy data in the next header below, and it's it. So let me just show you how that works, by the way. Let me go to mode name. And let me go to sync. So you see, basically, this is pretty printed JSON data of all the activities we're participating in. Now, if you wanted to switch machines, or for whatever reason you wanted to do a backup or something, you could just copy this into a text file. What you would also do is give a button over here, which when you click, download this in the text file automatically. The reason I did not do that is because I wanted to actually show you pretty printed JSON, as opposed to just showing your text file download button. But this is a two-way function. Not only can you download this data, you can also upload data that you previously say. So let's say instead of project M, let's say you say project M bots instead, right? And you save that. Now when you go back to track, that project has become project M bot. This is basically simply an import export. Nothing fancy going on. But the reason I've included it is to show you some of the underkey features which I want to talk about. Okay. So if we go back to the app. Now we've already seen the UI. I think, okay, let me just complete that discussion. A couple of instructions, a text area, and a button. That's it. Nothing fancy. Now, here's where the thing with it. Again, we follow the idea that of using a separate function to find things in. This could be a separate UMD module if that's what you decided. The first function is a function that gives me the entire state of the application. The app state currently, and even at the final version of this application, is completely encapsulated or completely represented by the activity list. So we just give the activity list, put it in an object, and that's an object that defines the app, or the state of the app. Then save that state. This just saves app state for local storage, pretty printed, so you can have to JSON as a under the helper. And the namespace we use is just the app state. That just made sense. 
um, load app state. So if you give me some app state, which you maybe have to use say, then I can load that into the app. So what that does is it tries to pass that out. Once it's passed out, it just sets it to all activity list. So activity list stops being whatever it used to be and starts being this new activity list. So basically you get your old data from maybe some different machine or backed up on Dropbox or whatever into your application. Uh, originally I was going to write a server to do all of this, but since it's a front-end demo and time is always ultimately limited and I want to answer questions, I said, okay, fine, let's just do local search. And there's a success for that. The success for that actually is in part for server implementation. So this would happen when the server you know, registers an ATAC success and then you would do the success for that. But even in any case, this just works, it's just fine. And you don't even have to supply it. If you don't supply it, it's just the empty function. Now, when you hit the submit button, the same button on that big import export form, here's what happens. We just get the data load apps uh, from new app JSON. Basically, this is the target event, the text area. We get its value and we ask our application to load app state. Basically, call this function. Just a wrapper around this. Uh, this is a wrapper around this, just a variable text area. That's it. Nothing fancy over there. Now, here's something that's interesting. You can get on render. Under it, like React, as I said in the beginning, will read under the whole DOM. But it won't really do that, it'll try to do as little as it can. But it will essentially, as far as you're concerned, read under the whole DOM. You might want to perform actions on every render. An example over here is every time you render, you did that because something changed, and whatever that change was, I'm going to save it. So this is what that does. So this function, uh, I guess this, was, this is the one, yeah, save app state gets bound to the on render function. This would be the same as defining this over here. Like, same app state might not even be a different function if that's really what you want. You could define it in line as an anonymous function within these threads. Within these threads. Okay. Now, local so now at the beginning of the app, when the app begins, you might have noticed this. When I refresh, my data doesn't go away. That's because this little bit of code was always there. Right? Although I was, you know, versioning to my HTML files, all my JavaScript was here. And this is what this was like basically the culprit, I guess. Local code will get item, the data that is stored, and then load that. So I'll refresh the data is preserved. Is this fine? So once you start understanding how Undertake gets sets and controls data and events, it's really simple to write something like a data syncing application. Right? Not very complex. I guess not very complex in any framework. And this kind of seems more complex than it is because I've broken down into functions, anticipating server usage. But um, Anyway, you could do it in possibly a few lines. Okay, so for now, we had a single template which is being rendered into the render target. But you can also have components, which you will use all the time. So let's talk about how that happens. That's when we open up version 9. Um, so what happens, let's see. Um, yeah. So in the time sheet, there used to be a table over there. Right. Now you already know that double curly variable, double curly means render the variable in the store, but that automatically escapes the variable for you. So there's no, you know, there's no fear of injection of malicious code or something like that. But if you really want to render HTML, then you just use triple curly. This syntax we just borrowed from OSAP, essentially. Um, because we like it. Triple means somehow it's, you're, you're more determined about rendering the exact thing than the double. So anyway, that's what it means. So what we're doing over here is we're calling the component activity log and we're passing this data to the component. Is that fine? That's what we're doing. Now let's just look at the component definition. Over here, my primary component, my primary template ends. Okay. This is the end of the template. Now you're defining your components. You can define components either before or after your template, however you prefer. But because we were going app by app and then you don't want some jiggy line numbers, I did this after. Usually I do this before. Um, so again, basically I copy paste the table over here. The only thing you need to remember is every component has to have an ID. And the name of the variable, which, which it will use to reference data. So in the main variable, remember when we said you can render the model TN from source template into render target and call that variable TN. So we use the variable TN. Over the default is submodel, but I've also explicitly asked the data to be passed in to be called submodel. Let me just go back real quickly. So what is the submodel? Um, so submodel is this data. So it expects an object which has a single property called an activity. 
this is what some model will be. Okay. So if I go back over here, that variable, which is an object containing the property object of follow that activity list, is now called some model. You can call it anything you want. So you could just call this activity list directly. And instead of passing an object that contains the property activity list, you could actually pass in the activity list itself. Right? But usually I don't do that because uh, inevitably I end up passing more and more data to my components. So I just wrap everything in an object anyway. So this is the same thing. The only difference is instead of tn or track or o or activity list get, this is just submodular activity list. Absolutely no difference at all. The basic idea is if you have an activity list, this component can render it. Now the whole point of defining a component is you want to reuse it. We haven't as yet used it, we just use this once. But we are going to reuse it in filters because we're not going to redefine how to render an activity list. We just want to use this definition over here. Let's go back to app.js. Yes. And the final version over here, it says implement filters using two way binding. And that's what we're going to do very soon. Let me open up the final version, which is the one we started with. But before I do that, let me just uh, go into JS and talk a little bit about how you can use computers and observables to make everything basically. Um, Something that you don't have to associate event handlers to, event free. So there is no dollar on event except even the hash chain event, which I have to subscribe to. So the project is the project, the day project I read. Let me just do a final demo of the application once again so that you get an understanding of what that does. Filters. So all of my data is over here. If I say project, that's a wrong If I say project A, it only shows you project data. And it does this automatically, trust me. Rather, it does this on its own because it knows the bindings. If I want to just see the task where the task is B, I just say D, it only shows me this one task. But you can also sort data. If you want to sort that by project, in this case, all projects are case, so it doesn't make sense. But if you want to sort that by task, it's that way, and you can change the sort order as well. You can go to sending. All of this is going to be implemented without attaching a single event handler because we are going to use, it to use computer properties to do this one. So again, V is my viewer. That's basically another module in your UMD kind of thing, or if you don't use UMD, then well, in your text files, in your JavaScript files, excuse me, which is observables and computers. The observables are the things you see over here, these things, all these observables, because these are changed directly by the user, and you want to observe changes to them. So these are observables. <laughs> Let me just talk about them. The project, the task, the from date, basically the starting range of the time to filter by, the end of the time to filter by, uh, what property do you want to start by, and in what order do you want to start? Simple questions. Options to start by. So basically, those are the options which you see over here. These options. Uh, we just put them in the list. You can start by these options, and the order can either be ascending or descending. This is fine. Now that once I've defined this, let me go back in over here and talk about this particular view, which is called viewer. Time sheet filtering. Again, we perform, and you can just ignore the pure U12, that's pure split system, not, of any, not very important here. The first thing we ask for is the from date, the to date. But I want you to notice something different about this than our previous, um, there are previous inputs in the tracker, in the reviewer, in the filterer, if you want to call it that. Filterer is again not a word, but filter, or I usually use filter to mean the word, so as now I will say filterer. Um, we have a binding order, a on input bind thing. This is a completely new. But the new sense haven't done this yet. What this means is whenever the input event occurs on this input, that means when somebody types something or paste something or delete something, bind the value attribute of this element. That means input dot value. And by input I mean the DOM element input, DOM element input dot value. Bind that to this observable. So the value of this observable changes the minute this input changes. But please bear in mind, this triplet on bind to gives you the UI to model binding, which you were not using until now. Until now, you were only using this model to UI binding. So if you want to bind both forwards and backwards, you need to do this, and you need to do this. Um, now, other frameworks like not which you used to use before, they kind of gave us options to do this, but what they used to do was they didn't tell us what I can put here. We didn't put anything in here. As long as it's a property of that element, it'll get bound. So it doesn't have to be valid, it could be a CSS property. 
it could be a nine hundred, something like that. Like whatever you decide you want it to be. Just put it in here, it'll get bound with that observable. The same thing for the time streams. And essentially the same thing for, for the project name, project task as well. Right? Now, the first time we're introducing a select element to a drop down list, very simple. We just loop over all the options that are create an option element for that, and that's done. Again, there's a forward binding over here. So, okay, I should not say forward, it's backward. There is a model to UI binding over here, and a UI to model binding over here. Both bindings are applied. Any questions until now? Thank you. No one is asking any question. Is like, can we understood this? Like, someone is a great speaker or what? I don't know if it's the, it's the latter of the two, but anyway, if you have questions, please do ask. Okay. Great. Uh, so, again, I just put this empty because I wanted things to look good. You can remove that. That basically is when I refresh the page, it says sort by empty. Because the rest of them were empty, I wanted this to be empty as well. Um, doesn't really matter what that is. So, this fine. We've defined observables, we've created the inputs for those observables, and we've set up two way binding between those observables and inputs. So let me demonstrate that very quickly to you. Let me say project or just project for that matter. And let me pn dot viewer dot o dot project. And it says project over here. Because the minute I change that, this also changes. That's what the two way binding was. Initially, if you go to the tracker form, that's not the case. If you change the project name over here, Tracker or code or project will not change. That remains exactly the same because it's only bound from model view one. Great. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Now that we've done this, the rest of the task is really, really simple. Trust me. Basically, you've done everything you need to do uh, to finish the app. The first thing we do is remember this is a string. This is an input string. We don't know if that's actually going to be a valid date. So we define a computer that gets us the millisecond timestamp corresponding to that interval. We just pass that as a date and work at time on that. That's it. That's the only thing we do. Remember, since we're calling get time, if this is an inline date, that will be man, not a number. And please remember that that's a falsy value because that's going to come up later on. The fact that from time is falsy, if there's no from time, that's all we need to know. Really Otherwise, it's a millisecond time. Stamp. The same thing for two time. And now, this is literally the end of the app. Uh, just two more functions. This is like pretty simple. So just this actually. Activities. Remember, we already have an activity list in the platform. That's a list of all the activities we did. But in the filter or in the viewer, we want to filter that activity list. So project A. Automatically, only the ones that correspond to project A should show up. The way we do that is this. If project name is true, that means if you enter some data for project, then if, if it's falsy, by the way, Underscore all means basically and all of these together, right? This and this and this and this. That's all it means. Uh, all this means all of these inputs, all, all of these elements of this array should be true or true thing. If it's falsy, that's the end of it. If it's falsy, that means we should pass this activity onward. However, if you've entered a project value whatever, then activity per project should be equal to uh, the input project name. I'm making myself clear. Basically, that means right now, project is empty. Task is also empty. That means don't do any filtering because you don't have anything to filter by. So that would be this condition over here. The or would never come into play because this is true. So you just go to the next one. So when all of them are empty, it will be true, 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 essentially. So all activities will be shown in order. When project is not empty, when there's some value, this will become false. The right hand side of the or will come into play. And the right hand side of the or says the activities project, or the name of the project with which the activity is associated, is the same as the name of the project that we import into my field. And if you've got this one, we're doing the exact same thing for tab. Almost the same thing for from that. With the difference that we use a less than comparison as opposed to a quality comparison. And then essentially the same thing for two times as well. So what this does over here is it gets only those activities that are interested in looking at. It establishes a filter. Once that's done, this is a return statement, by the way, right? So you know, you know how you guys know how filter works, right? Uh, basically, filter takes an input, a list, and a function. And if the function returns true, then the element on the list is retained; otherwise, it's rejected, right? 
And this is also built into JavaScript. You could have written this as a dot filter. And so on, right? So, and not just not in ECMAScript 6. Most of the code I'm writing here is ECMAScript 5 because I wanted people who are new to JavaScript to be able to get this as well. Okay, so that's filter. Okay, I'm going to make all changes because I want to do something. Okay, great. Once that's done, the only thing that we have to do is log in. Filtering is done. So we have the data in one shot. Now, all the, thing that, the only thing that we have to do is put in the right order. So here's how we do that. If sorting, if we sort by parameters 10, if it's not set, I'm not going to sort. Because you're going to ask me to sort. But if it is set, then just sort this. Sort this by the sort by parameter. So this is again building on the script. I'm just going, uh, you could do this on your own if you really want to do that. Basically, whatever the newest parameter is, uh, sorted by that. <coughs> So when I say uh, something like sort by task, sort by task, it puts the first task first. Okay. Once that's done, if the sort order is descending, if it's not descending, don't do this because then we have ascending sort. But if it's descending, reverse it. That's it. We already sorted. It. It's descending. You reverse it. Right? Okay. Done. We've done activity. Here. And activity just depends on each of these variables because it's the dependencies of the computer. So it depends on the original activity list that comes from the tracker, and then the project task from time uh, to time, sort by and sort order that the user defines. By defining this function, and by reusing the component that we just defined over here, that we just asked for uh, text component. Yeah, with this component, we can as a table, and then we can a component. So, thank you. Over here. Uh, by redefining just that one component, the minute we build the form and establish the observable, I, I know the form is long because there are a bunch of inputs in there. The minute we've done that and we've used Jupyter component, the only difference is previously we were doing something like tn dot uh, tracker dot o dot activity list. Over here it's tn dot tracker dot c dot tn dot viewer dot c dot activity list. That's the only difference. But the way we render something is exactly the same. No change. And then I also felt like computing the total charge because you're taking a filter view, maybe you want to invoice that customer of yours. So that's pretty simple, right? I mean, total charge is basically the sum of all the charges in activity the system. You could do this however you want. I just chose something to reduce. That's really it. Um, again, I, I think I'm uh, talking a lot about underscore because I, I know a lot of people are using it, but a lot of people are not for whatever reason. Um, and they will usually argue that JavaScript built ins are better. Yes, they are. If you feel like using array.map instead of underscore.map array, you should do that. But underscore also has a lot of other cool stuff, like findware and underscore now and Gitmo, which I will show you in a minute, which is really handy and you should just have it in your toolkit just in case. Like, it doesn't harm you to use it. Okay. Um, there's activity log, activity list, we did this. And once you complete the total charge, you just show it. You can complete the total charge whenever you want. And that's the end of all of this. This is just one thing. One small thing that's left for me to discuss. And that's when I'm in the filter log. And I say, oh, uh, it is this project A for task B. See, it takes me back to the tracker and it keeps populating this task. And let me show you how we do that. Um, I guess I should look for this one. Yeah, there we go. So we say if the way you click this edit button, this is the click handle for the edit button. If the active ID is not tracker, then please set location or hash or tracker. Please set location or hash or tracker. That means if this is not active, please make it active. And then underscore depot means uh, wait for the current cost active clear. So when you do this, uh, under click will change the route and stuff like that. We want to wait for that to happen. And once the current cost stack has cleared, we then want to bring the header into focus. Underscore depot is essentially the same as set timeout with zero. Set time of zero. Remember, set time of zero does not happen at the same time, although it's zero, because it's asynchronous. That's what underscore default does. That's the entire app. You just build a complete time cycle application with charge computation. And you can basically take a printer of your filter. Uh, maybe you want to charge your customer for project A. You take a printer of this, right? And once you've done that, you just send it to them by email or something. Or maybe you use invoice ninja or whatever online invoice you do already and like that's it. Any questions now at the end of all of this?
How much time do you have? I had I had time like if you have questions. Yeah, 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 Excuse me. Uh, if sort by is not true, okay, that means that these are sending, not descending. We don't sort it at all. Right? Okay, so let's actually demo that because we can see it. Let me just refresh that. Yeah, project A. There are a bunch of those there. And then B, C, B. Is this, is this sorted? I don't know. Task A, K, uh, Let's go descending. Let's go ascending. Yeah, the sort the sort by was not populated, right? So how how was it going to sort? So let's start sort by tasks. And you can see uh, now since it's sorted by task, it's ascending, right? Okay, it's ascending. So if you want, what you could do over there, um, you could go into HTML and uh, just remove this option over there. Let me just mark it up because I like it. So it'll be <laughs> because see, when you tell me sort by, and you don't tell me what order to sort in. I can either assume ascending or descending, right? Because I know you told me to sort. And I think a single choice is ascending. So that's why it was ascending. So I'm just going to keep it like it used to be. Okay. If you have any more questions, uh, yeah. Question on um, your to model point. Yeah. Uh, so is, can I only map the attributes of that particular element to the model? Or can I like map something else also? Assuming that I make a select like component which I want to pass the ID to the model instead of like the value. Right? Yeah, and you can, you can, you can. Also, what about like uh, on mouse events or some other events? Like sure, sure. Any events you want, you can use. Most of the times, I find that the only events I use are click, import, submit, and that's it. Most of the times. But of course, if you're building touch sciences yeah. and stuff like that, you might want to have like a bunch of events. Now, just to tell you, the project is uh, released this uh, this morning, so that's my internet is not the connection is not, not connected to that, so that's. Don't worry, you can send me to be the link. Yeah. yeah. It's just github.com slash polygon, you only find it over there. Now, I have another question. Yeah. So, um, is it possible to replicate uh, this architecture, like the architecture that you just described, mm -hmm. in a normal React Redux architecture that everyone usually uses? Really model our app state as an observable mm -hmm. and then compute or derive state using selectors. So, would I be able to replicate what, what you just did, like everything that you just said? All of my app state was an observable instance, mm -hmm. and all of the derived state that depended on my own state was being calculated, Correct. computed, mm -hmm. as in you use mm -hmm. the word computed using selectors. Mm -hmm. So, the selectors are automatically memoized, so they only return a new uh, instance of some property. Like, Something changed. Okay. So, so, a couple of questions to help me understand. Okay. You yeah. By selector, do you mean CSS selectors? No, no, no. no. As in sele a selector is like uh, if I pass in uh, a path, for okay. a deeply nested path of my state, okay. then it's going to return a new value only if that value changed, that deeply nested thing changed. So, it's basically a memoized function which will only return something yeah. if so the value changed. Any app you're currently working on with React yeah. or Angular or whatever? Whatever way of framework. Can be built using undertake. Definitely. Okay. But you don't need your entire app state to be observable. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, your right over here in our app, the very first thing we add is um, app name. Yeah. That's yeah. not observable. So no, uh, yeah. this question was uh, asked because I was sort of trying to get the big ideas out of the thing that you just suggested because you said a lot of things. So most of the things got lost, lost in the noise of the UI details right, right, or the right. app that you were trying right, to right, right. But the big idea that, that you were talking about probably, mm -hmm. I think, was uh, modeling your state as well as in, as well as well user interactions mm -hmm. as an observable stream, right? Correct, correct. And using uh, computed properties rather than re-rendering on any random change. Right. Re rendering only when something actually changes. So that was a big idea, right? Or what is there right, sure. else that, that was one of the ideas, yeah. Okay. Sure. So I want to know the other ideas as well. Like is there anything else that I missed besides this? Hmm. Uh, so there are a bunch of things. Okay. Uh, so we are building a full scale application, right? All of most of all the users uh, uh, uses Okay. okay. So our application is really large and it has a bunch of uh, things going on. Mm -hmm. And when users type really quickly, 
if you want to compute a property based on that input event, it can really break things. So we have debounce handlers. Okay, cool. Sure, debounce right? handlers. Okay. Yeah. So we have debounce handlers. Okay. Another thing we do is our rendering logic. Uh, if you just call, there's a function 